worship this evening, but you're encouraged to attend other congregations in our presbytery, and they were on the screen the different times. And as far as I know, um, the speakers, they, uh, the, I don't think all the men let me know who would be there when they'd be on holiday, so uh, I don't know uh, the details. Next Lord's Day, the prayer time at 11 o'clock uh, on conference call and our worship here at 12 noon as usual. Do you remember the pro Nata meeting of the Presbytery on the 27th of July uh, in our hall at 7.30? And then just in a practical matter, we have changed uh, telephone providers, so uh, you will now have to dial 028 to even you're dialing from your home number. So if you're wanting to dial, uh, call us uh, in our home then the home number will be 028 2764925 you'll have to dial the whole thing so just a practical note for your information i think that's all i need to mention let's just take a thought as we uh, come before god to prepare to worship him <clears throat> Text this morning, all nations that you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. And that's what uh, we are called to do. That's what man is supposed to be doing, glorifying God. And we want to come this morning in worship of God to glorify and magnify his name. We begin with praise to God from Psalm 96, the A version. We're singing stanzas 1 to 6. And the Genesis Converse 257. Come sing to the Lord a new song. All the earth sing to the Lord. To the Lord sing. Praise his name. His saving grace each day record. We sing praise. We glorify God. Psalm 96a, 1 to 6. The tune is 257. Let us worship God together.
Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. We rejoice, O God, that we can come to praise your name. For you are worthy. Worthy that we should exalt you and magnify you because you have looked down upon us in your saving grace and in your mercy. You have called us into your presence that we might give you that glory, that praise that is your due. And Father, we rejoice that we can ascribe to you the glory, the honor, the praise that is yours. For there is none like you, mighty, creating, eternal, holy, just God. And yet, Lord, we thank you for that love and compassion in which you meet us in Jesus Christ. And we pray that today as we worship you, so we might be drawn near to you, that you might be pleased to speak to our hearts and to help us to walk in your paths. So, Lord, bless us with your presence. Accept of us and speak with us. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. First reading this morning is from the book of Ezekiel. Going to turn to Ezekiel chapter 36 and beginning to read at verse 22. Turning to Ezekiel chapter 36 and we're going to read from verse 22. Turning to the prophet Ezekiel chapter 36 at verse 22. Let us hear God's word. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them, then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I show myself holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your, you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people, and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the corn and make it plentiful, and will not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field, so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds, and you will loathe yourselves for your sins and detestable practices. I want you to know that I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Sovereign Lord. Be ashamed and disgraced for your conduct, O house of Israel. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. On the day I cleanse you from all your sins, I will resettle your towns and the ruins will, will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass through it. They will say, this land that was laid waste has become like the Garden of Eden. The cities that were lying in ruins, desolate and destroyed, are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations around you that remain will know that I, the Lord, have 
rebuilt what was destroyed and have replanted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Once again, I will yield to the plea of the house of Israel and do this for them. I will make their people as numerous as sheep, as numerous as the flocks of for offerings at Jerusalem during her appointed feasts. So will the ruined cities be filled with flocks of people. Then they will know that I am the Lord. And there at verse 38, we pray that God will bless to us his holy word. <clears throat> now a word to our younger members. I want to think about what do we see here? Can you see, I've probably given it away on the, putting these two things together, but you can see what's on the screen. Do you know what it is? I wonder, what do you think it is? Harry doesn't know. Anybody know what this is? Has anybody here had one of these? I maybe you could ask with your hands up. I'm sure lots of us have had an X-ray. You look at your hand, you can't actually see the bones in your hand, but you can see on the screen the X-ray on, your, on the right. The X-ray shows you all the little bones in your hand. And sometimes the doctors have to take X-rays of all parts of us. And they will discover that perhaps there's a bone that is broken or something that is wrong. And then they can bind it up. If it's your arm, you put a plaster on it to fix it. But the X-ray sees, sees right deep down where we can't see with our eye. And when I was thinking about that, it reminded me that God sees us. God sees into your very heart. When we think about what is said in Job for his eyes, that's the eyes of God are on the ways of a man. He sees all his steps. Sometimes you might think your way is hidden. What you're saying, what you're doing is hidden. We're reminded by Job, we're reminded by an x-ray. God sees. Or Psalm 33, the Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of men. Not only does he see uh, uh, <coughs> all man's steps, he sees all of us, every one of us. And so we are reminded that God knows all about us. He sees every part of us. And we need to live and act in the light of him seeing. Seeing the good things, seeing the bad things. And we need to pray for forgiveness when we do bad. We need to remember he sees not just others, he sees me, he sees all oh, my heart, what lies within. So it's a good lesson to remember. God sees us and he sees far more than we might even think or imagine. Like an x-ray, he can see right into our core of our being, into our very hearts. Well, let's just bow in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you that your word comes to us to remind us that you see us. Help us, Lord, to walk in your paths. Forgive us for our many faults as we can think about the things we have said, done, the things that we have thought that you see that we would be ashamed about. Lord, forgive us. Help us, Lord, to walk in your paths. Forgive us through Jesus Christ. Help us to be his. Lord, may you see us in him, trusting in him, so that we are seen as righteous because of Jesus. Lord, hear our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Let's turn again back to the word of God. We're going to turn back to the book of Romans. And we're going to read from Romans and uh, chapter 1 to begin with, at the very beginning. Romans, and reading the very beginning of the book of Romans. And then we'll be turning to chapter 16. So we're reading, first of all, from Romans chapter 1 at verse 1. Let us hear 
God's word. Romans 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake, we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith, And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. And then turn over to chapter 16, and we're going to read the last uh, few verses from verse, chapter 16, verse 25. Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray God to bless his own word. Let us again come before God as we would approach him in prayer. Let us pray together. Lord God in heaven, we draw near to you and acknowledge your power and your grace toward us. You are a holy God, yet in love you are so long-suffering of us as sinners, merciful and gracious. You have not treated us as our sins deserved, but rather you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, that through him we might have life. Oh, we marvel, O oh God, at your great love. And Father, we pray that you might come near to us, that you might forgive all our faults, Lord, we would worship you and give thanks for your great care. Teach us, O Lord, your ways. Lead us in your paths. Take away all arrogant and prideful thoughts. May we be humble to know that we have a God in heaven worthy of of our praise, worthy of our giving all glory to him. Lord, indeed, lead us even today that as we hear the word of your truth, we will bow before you to exalt you even more, rejoicing that you have revealed yourself and made known to us, Jesus, that we might know you. Father, we pray 
pray that it will please you in our day through the proclamation of your word to call people to faith. That we, we pray, O oh God, you will soften the hard hearts, that you will open up the doors of the hearts of those who have not believed, that they might realize their need to trust fully on Jesus Christ as Lord. And Father, we pray that in these days, you will just build your church, for it is your work. Lord, we pray too for our country in these days. Father, we look at our, the leaders in Westminster. We realize, O oh God, that they need to be spoken to by God. And we pray, Father, you will speak that the MPs from whatever party might realize the grave and solemn responsibility they have taken on to serve under God in the leadership of our nation. We pray particularly, O oh God, for the Conservative Party as they would elect a new leader, and as that leader will most likely be the new Prime Minister. We pray, Heavenly Father, that in this your sovereign work will be done. Oh, we would long for righteousness. We long for leaders who have stature and who will uphold the things of God, who would recognize the foolishness of some of the things that have passed in recent years for law. But Lord, we may be frustrated as your people thinking that that could not happen, but you're the God of the impossible and who can deal with people in this way. So we cry to you, O God, may your will be done. Father, above all, we pray that the freedom we have to proclaim Christ and to challenge the wayward nature of our society will remain, that we will continue to be able to freely and unashamedly espouse the truth of your word and of all the implications of following Jesus to do with life, and morality and sexuality, that we will uphold the standard that you have given. Lord, grant us your favor and empower your people, whether it be in public speaking or in private word, that we would be unashamed to stand for Jesus Christ as Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray in that case you will build our faith, strengthen us in our trust in you. And in these days, O oh God, may our children growing up hear the word of Christ. May they be challenged, encouraged to walk in that way. Lord, we commit to you our need here as a congregation. We are mindful of those at home today who are prevented from coming for various reasons, those who are laid aside in weakness, those who are still dealing with COVID, those, O oh God, who are frail. We commend to you, we ask your comfort and blessing and encouragement to them through your word. We pray, O oh God, that you will come near to each of us according to our need, that you will speak to our hearts, that we will be built up. Father, comfort those who mourn today. Encourage them. May they know that even in the face of sadness, Christ reigns. Lord, hear these our prayers. And Father, may we know the help and blessing that comes from looking unto Jesus and being encouraged in his word. Lord, we ask all this in his name and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> Before we come to the word, we're going to uh, sing praise from Psalm 86. Psalm 86, the C version. And again, we're singing stanzas one to six, and the tune is Conwell number 284. Attend thou and answer, Jehovah, give ear. I, needy and poor, make my plea. Preserve thou my soul, save thy servant. And that should be our plea day after day. We long that the Lord would show us mercy. We long that God would forgive us that in the midst of our days of trouble, he will be our God who answers us. Psalm 86, C, 1-6, the tune 284. Let us praise God together.
It can be the case that with us, many times we speak, we can speak lots of words uh, when in reality less would do. You will have heard people deliver an address perhaps in work or on some subject or other and you come away thinking about it and you think to yourself they did a lot of speaking but they didn't impart much information. They didn't really, uh, they, they could have said all they said in a much better or a much more concise manner. Unnecessary words that add very little to what you understood of the subject. And if that is true of our speech, it can be true also when we write. Uh, perhaps you put a lot of words down on the paper when many less would do. I would have been guilty in my younger days of thinking, how am I going to get the word count up? Uh, I had very little maybe to say on a particular paper at university or something, and you just, yeah, and, and we would have called it waffle. And of course, you weren't adding anything. It wasn't going to gain you many marks, but adding something. But the word of God, when we come to Paul's letters, every word, every word is important. And as we come to the end of Paul's letter to the Romans, to the benedictions, we come to words that are no less vital for us than the words uh, in the middle of the letter. Not one word in the scripture is used to pad out the theme, but everything is written as guided by the Holy Spirit for your benefit and for mine. And so this, this morning we come to these last words at the end of Romans 16, and Paul is here a rather longer benediction than in some of his letters. Some of it's, it's very concise, but here uh, we have a word of, it is in a sense, a benediction, a last word. Paul is writing to finish off his letter. At the beginning, Paul had spoken in this letter of wanting to come to meet with the Roman people, Roman believers. He longed to be there among them, and uh, he is writing to them this letter, and he has a purpose. He has written to encourage them and to build them up. We read there at the very beginning of the Paul's letter, he wanted to impart some spiritual gift, some teaching to build them up in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we will find at the end of this letter his continuing desire through his word written and going forward would be that they would be established or that they would be strengthened in the gospel. And that is the benediction that he brings, that they might be further strengthened or established. The word is translated in the NIV as establish you in the gospel. It could mean to strengthen you. It's to build them up. I'm going to use the word strengthen. And so this morning as we come to the benediction, we want to think about these verses and focus on the strengthening that Paul has for his people. And first of all, to think about the one who strengthens, because Paul brings that to the fore. Now to him who is able to establish. We immediately might, well, who's the him? Well, we need to jump down then to verse 27, because the rest, what he brings in after that is a sense parenthesis. We go down to verse 27. To him, to the only wise God, be glory. Here is the one who is able to strengthen you. Here is the one who is able to give encouragement. Paul is looking to God to be the one who will do the work. There will be times, perhaps in your life, like there have been in mine, when you feel perhaps your faith, your commitment to Christ is not doing very well. And you may go through a phase when you try to strengthen and encourage your own faith in your own way. But the problem with you and with me trying to do it ourselves is that we only find continuing weakness 
we find difficulty. In fact, we are simply reminded that it is the work of God to him who is able, Paul says. The one who is able to strengthen you. Who is that? The only wise God. He is the one that needs to be at work in you. We are to depend upon him and through the living Christ to be built up, to be strengthened. And we need always to be looking to him. We think of what we read in Ezekiel 36 as God speaks to Israel. Who is going to do all the work? If you think about what we read, God says, I will do it. I will build you up. I will bring you back. I will give you a land. I will give you a people. It is God who builds up his people, Israel. And it is God today who builds up his church. It is God who builds up the individual's faith. It is God who disciplines and challenges in your sin. That's what he did with Israel. And that's what he will do with you and with me. And how does he do that? Well, we'll come to the means shortly, but if we are to be built up in faith, it must be from the hand of God as, in fact, we serve him. It will be as you seek to do his will, as you worship him, as you simply give yourself over to God. Then he will strengthen you. He will do the work in you. We can't just sit back and say, well, it's all of God. We'll do nothing. No, it is God's work, but it will be done as you give service and honor to him. The latest series of Rugby Internationals have just finished. And one might ask why at the end of a long season, rugby players And of course, there are other sports, but they come and they go away and play these tough, tough international matches. Well, they have done all the training. Could they not just do the physical training in in themselves? And the answer is no. They need what is called match fitness. Actually playing the game strengthens not only their body, but their psychological, their mind for the sport. It is as they do the actual game. They are built up. And it is as you and I are involved in the work of God that he puts on, as it were, muscle on your faith. It's as we do God's work, we become stronger because he uses that. He challenges us. He teaches us when we are serving him. Christian who thinks he can strengthen his own faith with a lot of study and sitting there not interacting with anybody well, he may gain a mind of understanding, but it's a different thing when you're confronted by someone who asks the awkward question or who puts to you some completely contrary view of life. Where do you turn? How will your faith be strengthened? God God will give you the answer. And you need to be ready to look to God and to honor him. Thus, it is God who strengthens our faith. But let's think a bit more about the means of strengthening. And Paul comes to this. Um, It is as we exercise our faith, as we go forward serving him. But note as we think about the exercise or the means of strengthening our faith, Paul is one thing that we need to learn that is at the very center of it. It centers on Jesus Christ. Look what he says. To him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. He is the one who is to be the very centerpiece of all that we think and do. It is the proclamation of Jesus that Paul says is what will establish you more and more. He who came to suffer and die on the cross 
for sin. He who bore your sin away, he who conquered death and is risen from the grave, Jesus Christ, that all has to be about him. Paul calls it in these words, my gospel. Well, he's not in any way saying it is simply his. It's not, of course, his gospel in the sense someone says it's all about me. No, Paul is saying the gospel which I have proclaimed to you, the gospel which throughout this letter we have noted him speaking, it always pointed to Jesus. Ask Paul about his gospel, he would immediately speak of Jesus Christ. We could look back over the book of Romans itself and see how he focuses on Christ. Chapter 3, he was the one who would come and be the righteousness for us that we might know forgiveness. He is the one who has appeared to fulfill the law. That, and that is what the prophets testified about, Paul said. That Jesus, this one who would come, the one who has conquered death, the one who shows us that we, through him, have life. And that nothing can separate us from the love of God because Jesus Christ has brought us into the care and into the hand of God. And your faith can only be strengthened as it is centered upon Jesus Christ as Lord and God, the Mighty One. What will God do in you? He will bring you ever closer to Jesus. You're going through a period of difficulty. It's frustrating, perhaps a time of bereavement, and you are struggling, and you ask, Lord, why? It's only later as you look back that you realize God wants, wanted you, and you had to trust all on more on him. People challenge your faith, and you're struggling to answer and yet God gives you the word and you look back and thank God he, he enabled you and it strengthens you. You're able to go forward the next time and be more assured, not because you have any ability, but because your God in Jesus Christ is working in you to strengthen your faith. But as Paul speaks about Jesus Christ, he mentions how this is a revelation that was once hidden. And I want us to think about the hidden revelation that this once was because Paul puts it this way uh, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for ages past what does Paul mean that this was hidden well it was hidden for ages past and he's referring to the old testament he's referring to the writings of the prophets who spoke of the messiah who would come the mystery of the outworking of that remained for them. When Isaiah or Ezekiel spoke about the one who would come, they could not see how God would overrule sin, how God would deal with sin to take it away and yet give men grace. The prophets foretold the events that they wrote down being men of spiritual character, seeking after God, they trusted God in the mystery of what he was going to do in their future. But they simply rested upon God. It was to them a mystery. How is God going to take away my sin? But they rested by faith in the God they knew. More than the people of God, how would the Gentiles ever know the God of the Jew? How would they ever come to know the God of all creation? For they had turned their backs on him completely. And the revelation, the, the word of God came through Israel, not through the Gentiles. Surely the revelation, the mystery was hidden certainly to the nations. If we had been living in the days of the prophets prior to the coming of Christ, we would have very little understanding of God at all. 
the mystery of God. We would have watched Israel and wondered about their worship and their God. But it would have remained a mystery. Yes, there were Gentiles. There were those who came to Israel, who embraced God. But for them, as with Israel, how is God going to take away the horror of their sin, their disobedience? They simply stepped out in faith in the God who would do marvelous things. They did come to faith. We read in the Old Testament, we read of the psalmist, God is our refuge and a strength. What great faith that was. Surely, as we read that, you and I should learn from them. God should use that in our lives if they were able to trust in the midst of a mystery. How much more you and I, who have had this mystery revealed, and it has been made known. How you and I need to rejoice that it's a revelation that was only was once hidden, but is now made known. Think about the Old Testament believers. Think about how they stepped forth before God when they didn't even know that there would be a Messiah sent of God himself Yes, they looked forward through the mists of time and the prophecies that they gave. But it still, to them, was amazing, a mystery. But it has been made known. It is now made known so that you and I, Gentiles though we be, are without excuse. This is the mystery that has been proclaimed by Paul. It is the mystery of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he who was in heaven and gave himself over to the will of the Father and came into the world as a man born of the Virgin Mary to live as a man, a God-man, that he should bear the consequences of our sin, though he had no sin. And it has been revealed, this is how God deals with sin. And you and I are in a much stronger position than the, those who were looking forward in the Old Testament days. And God makes this mystery known to strengthen your faith. He tells you these things that you might trust in him. It's a reasonable faith. Sometimes we look at the world and we think how totally unreasonable some of the things they trust in or believe are. There's no logic. There's nothing behind them. It's just a big bang. It just happened. Christianity is a reasonable faith because we have heard that God, in answer to all that he spoke of through the prophets, sent his son, the perfect man, to suffer and die that sinners might be saved. Look what he says. But now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God so that all nations might believe and obey him. And so our faith is strengthened as we recognize Jesus revealed. And this mystery has been made known through Christ, through the, the gospel of the New Testament and there is a sense in which this mystery will need to continue to be made known. Jesus Christ was the one the prophets spoke of and looked forward to, though to them still a bit of a mystery. Today it has been made plain. Do you believe it? Have you had your sin dealt with through Jesus Christ? Are you in faith, established strong in Jesus because that's what has been revealed and that's the truth of the gospel. And it has been revealed not only that the Jews might turn to the Messiah but for all the nations. Just let's think about that. 
Jesus came certainly for the Jew. We need to pray today that many who are brought uh, up uh, from the nation of Israel who can follow their line of descent by blood right back to Abraham. Lord, we would pray, show them that their brother Jesus has come, the Messiah, the one in whom they and their sin uh, has been dealt with. Through him they have life. What a joy to hear of those who have recognized the mystery is revealed from the Jewish faith. But it has been revealed for all nations. Paul makes it very clear so that all nations might believe and obey. That's what Paul was proclaiming, of course. He wanted, as we thought of earlier in our series, he wanted to go and preach the word where it had not been preached to show the nations that this is the means of bringing you to God that you might glorify him. Jesus Christ, the revelation that was once hidden, revealed. Why? That, be- that nations would believe. And your and my faith should be strengthened and established because it has come to us. What a joy we have Jesus have learnt about. Give thanks to God that we have the scriptures, that in your earliest days, Jesus was made known to you. Think about those today who still do not hear the message of life. Think about those who do not have the scripture in their own language. What a huge disadvantage. And so in that sense, the work of mission is ongoing the work of continuing to reveal to others the mystery of how the holy God can receive the sinful, godless man into his presence. The proclamation of Jesus, the only Savior. Today, let us pray that this word will go forward and may we be the very uh, means for some to hear of Jesus in all his glory. Today, of course, there are many who are in utter ignorance of the gospel. It is hidden from them. They may hear the words, but because of Satan blinding their eyes, they do not know the truth. It is hidden. Our prayer would be that God in his mercy will reveal himself and reveal Jesus Christ as the only Savior. Not only bring them to faith, but then establish them, strengthen them, that we might go forward with him. And as we go out in that work, as we see God at work, that strengthens our own faith. For God will do it. Yes, it is God's work. Back to Ezekiel. Who is doing it? God says, I will bring my people. I will bring them back to all the fullness of life. And today he will call people to himself. He will do it. and He will lift them up to the glory of his name. And it is there we want to finish today. Why should your faith and mine be strengthened or established? What's the reason? What's it all about? Why does God call you to himself? Well, first of all, because he made you, and he made you for himself, that you might glorify him. And that's how Paul ends his letter. And now to him, to the only wise God, be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Why should you walk in faith? Because it brings glory to your creator, to God Almighty. Why should you seek to faith strengthened and daily walking in his ways? Because you are to glorify God. Your purpose in life, your whole life, is to be lived in honor to him who is the Lord of all, the King of glory, the one whom you know through Jesus Christ. Because remember, Jesus said, if you know me, you know my Father 
And it is to God that all praise and honor is to be given. We are to be strong in the Lord because it magnifies him. And again and again in the Old Testament, we have this note in the Psalms and in other places that it's all to the glory of God. That's why the first of the shorter catechisms, what is man's chief end? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's what we are about. That's what our faith is about. That is what we are to do. And we do it by serving him, honoring him, proclaiming him, living for Jesus, and pleading for mercy when we feel and when our sin is before you, before him. So may we all be established, strengthened in faith for the glory of God, we know the means he uses as we serve him, focusing on Jesus Christ, the one who was hidden in the day just past, but now has been revealed, made known, that we as the nations should praise him. All glory and honor to his name. May he be made known even yet. And may we not fail to seek to make him known by our walk and our word in the days to come. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, how we are weak and how we need you, our God, to strengthen us, even as we seek to walk in your paths, for we know that is where we will find you helping us. Lord, we cannot do it of ourselves. Sometimes we even read your word and it goes over us, through us, without our really taking it on board and applying it. Father, by your Spirit, Lord, work in us to establish our faith, to strengthen us, that we will be unashamed of the one who has been made known in these days, Jesus Christ, the one who has been revealed to us, Gentiles though we be, that we might magnify his name. Lord, may it be our purpose to bring glory to God, to be strong in magnifying you, our Lord, in heaven, that others, even through us, might be drawn to know the God who made them, the God before whom they will stand on the day of judgment. Father, bless your word. Strengthen us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to conclude as we turn to Psalm 147. <clears throat> Psalm 147, the A version, and we're singing stanzas 1 to 4, and then 7 and to 9. The psalmist says, The Lord prays, for it's good that psalms to our God we raise, because it is delightful and fitting him to praise. Then we note the Lord builds up Jerusalem. What's Jerusalem today? It is the church. The Lord builds it up as he builds up the individuals within the church. The brokenhearted, those who have sorrows, he heals, he deals with them, he relieves them. He is the Lord who upholds the humble. He will cast the wicked down, those who reject him. Oh, how they need to realize They'll be cast off unless they repent and turn to him. The Lord will take delight in all those who do him fear, those who honor and magnify his name. Psalm 147, the A version, 1 to 4, 7 to 9. The tune is Heber 219. Tune 219, let us praise God together.
receive the blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with God's people now and always. Amen.